Good afternoon, everyone. This is the health and housing track for the Homes Within Reach Conference. And we're here today to talk to you about Housing Smart, which is a collaborative pilot project aimed at reducing potentially avoidable emergency department and hospital admissions among homeless individuals. My name is Kathleen Mullen. I'm with Keystone First, and we are one of four project partners. And I'm going to pass it on uh, to my colleagues so they can introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Patrick Baltimore, Project Manager of Temple University Health System. Bill Maroon, Director of Business Development for Resources for Human Development. Kristen, you're on mute. Thank you, Patrick. I'm Kristen Beck. I'm the Director of Community Health Programs for Health Partners Plans. Thanks. Uh, so one of the primary goals for this project, and which is particularly interesting for this audience, is to demonstrate the valuable role of stable housing in improving health and quality life outcomes for homeless individuals with complex conditions and who are receiving Medicaid under Pennsylvania's Health Choices Program. The goal of this session is to outline the distinguishing characteristics of Housing Smart, which involves two Medicaid managed care organizations, a major health system, and a service provider. We'll describe how the project came together, how it's structured, the target population, how we pivoted during COVID-19, and to share some very promising preliminary results. And I'm going to pass it over to Patrick. Thank you. So without further ado, and not bearing the lead, we've housed 25 people. Um, it, it was a long, hard road, and I'll let Bill uh, share more details on that. Um, but we have 25 people living in apartments, uh, and, it's, and it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and also our, our hypotheses are being proven where uh, if you provide the appropriate level of support, individuals will become empowered to overcome gaps of care, and ultimately it, it leads to better health outcomes. So a few of the quality metrics that we decided to focus on um, as indicative of better health is simple utilization. I think moving forward, we might get a little bit more in depth with the quality uh, metrics that we use, but for right now, we're planning to, to keep it simple. Um, take a look at the, the decrease in emergency department visits, hospital visits, uh, and increase in outpatient visits. So explaining this data a little bit more, we're comparing average monthly utilization uh, for the entire year previous to the date the actual patient moved into their apartment. Um, so for emergency department visits, that's a 76% decrease. For hospital visits, it's a 92% decrease. And observation, obviously, 100% decrease. Uh, but another really good quality metric to look at is the increase in outpatient visits, the most appropriate level of care for the patients that are uh, being seen by this program. So we're, we're very proud to present these, these data. Um, so Bill, uh, pass to you. I, if you can advance the slide. So uh, how did this get started? So late in 2016, uh, RHD was approached by the Alliance of North Carolina to put a housing caseworker into the emergency room at Duke University Hospital. The Alliance is a behavioral health managed care entity in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's North Carolina's managed care system was similar to the behavioral health car carve out here in Pennsylvania. Uh, Ann Oshel, who's the executive at the Alliance, noticed that there were about 25 homeless people who frequent the, frequented the ER at Duke. She worked with the continuum of care of, of Raleigh to make sure that there were 25 housing subsidies available for the program. So we stationed a caseworker named Rodney Daniel in the ER at times when these individuals typically showed up. Um, within a few months, Rodney had housed 17 people. As a result, we started working with the hospital and the Alliance to try to review the outcomes. So they gave us all the utilization data for the uh, emergency room. And we looked at the numbers and we saw that we were reducing uh, utilization in the ER by 66%. And we thought that was amazing. So we met with the Alliance and that we said, do you see this number? And they said, no, we don't see that number. And we are saying, well, well, how are you crunching the numbers? And they were looking at the date that we, ha we started the program, which was February 1st, 2017. And they were looking at utilization prior to, to 
February 1st and moving forward. And we explained that that's not how we think it should be done. We should look at the date that the person was actually housed, was given their keys, and then look backwards at their utilization and then look forward at their utilization. So the Alliance went back and did that. And then they came back to us and said, yes, you're right. It's a 66% reduction in, in ER use. So we thought we're onto something here and we started to do a, uh, uh, a review of who else around the country is doing this. And we found that there's similar programs in San Jose, Denver, Chicago, Massachusetts, and Kansas City. Kansas City was the most similar program. They had housed 20, 22 people, and within six months, they found a 68% reduction in utilization in the ER. Uh, as a result, the housing, uh, the hospital system in Kansas City started a program called 505, where the hospital system is actually going to fund 500 units of supportive housing in Kansas City over the next five years. So with this data, we tried to approach uh, both um, Jefferson and Temple here in, in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. Um, Jefferson wouldn't meet with us because they didn't think it was uh, for whatever reason, but we did get a meeting with uh, Patrick's boss, Steve Carson at Temple. And when we, we presented all the data to Steve, at the end of the meeting, he said, we've been working on this homeless issue for about two years. And we have a lot of people who who experience homelessness, who frequent our ER, and uh, this could really help us out. And he went about pulling all these partners together and I'll pass it all off to Patrick and the next slide. So speaking of Temple University Health System, which is located in North Philadelphia, uh, the, the people that we serve, our community, 86% are covered by government health programs, 45% live below the 100% federal poverty level. Um, so when, when my boss Steve was mentioning, trying to think outside the box for providing the, the much needed support to the people that we serve, uh, we, we ran the numbers. So in 2019, there were 350 people who were identified as homeless based on criteria such as they had no address in our electronic medical record or they claimed a, an emergency shelter address as well as a, a company called broad street ministry which provides mail service for uh, homeless individuals in the city of philadelphia um, and uh, we, we saw 350 people uh, went to the ed at least four times in 2019 so that was our, our starting point um, we also interviewed staff across the health system and the extremely complex needs that these patients have, you just don't have, aren't afforded the time to be able to uh, in, engage at a level which will make a difference in this person's life. So we, we, we needed to partner with somebody. Uh, and then it, it all just kind of pointed to, this is a multifaceted issue which requires a multifaceted team. Uh, and that's what we're presenting on today. So Kathleen. Thanks, Patrick. So both Keystone First and Health Partners Plans are Medicaid managed care organizations in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, just point out we are competitors, but at the same time, we really are collaborators on this project and it's really been a wonderful experience in that regard. Um, so how it works is both of us pay for services rendered at the healthcare providers, uh, Temple being a main example of that. We have provider agreements with Temple. Um, but as, as it was cited yesterday as part of the plenary session, there's been a shift in our industry away from the fee-for-service model to a value-based care system, which compensates providers like Temple based on member outcomes rather than paying for fee for services that were rendered. Um, so with that shift, there's been an intense focus on the social determinants of health, which are, as many people know, the conditions in which individuals live, learn, and work, and that affect a wide range of health outcomes. Um, but poverty, as we know, um, with the COVID-19 pandemic um, has, is a major public health sh issue and one that is both systemic and is shown to disproportionately um, impact communities of color. So both Keystone First and Health Partners seek to improve the quality of health care that members receive by working with providers to coordinate care in arrangements that Dr. Jacob spoke about yesterday. Um, so we hire as a company uh, community health navigators and case managers to assist our members in accessing care 
and obtaining resources that they need by making um, vital kind of resource connections. Uh, we also seek to address care gaps, which are discrepancies between recommended best practices and the care that is actually provided in an exam room. So these can include things like individuals who are missing age-based or annual screenings or vaccines, or individuals who do not consult with their doctors over prescribed medications. Um, but we as MCOs traditionally have had a difficult time engaging with this population because of their homelessness and or their housing instability. Um, for a lot of the reasons that the audience here today probably knows. Um, the addresses and the phone numbers that we have on file uh, may not be valid, um, so that makes outreach uh, particularly challenging. Uh, the member that may, may be living in unsafe conditions um, and they may not be able to store or take uh, medications. Um, and members may not have a relationship with a primary care provider and will use the emergency department as a primary means for accessing health care. Um, and, and overall, um, Medicaid MCOs are pretty limited in what they can pay for. Um, and so with this arrangement, we're paying strictly for services um, with the Housing Smart Pilot. Um, but overall, we hope by engaging together Temple, a major health system, the two Medicaid and managed care organizations who are contracting with RHD for services, we do hope to demonstrate the value of um, stable housing in our members. Um, and it's something that we're excited to share today. Thanks, Kristen. Kathleen. Thank you. Um, that was a great introduction um, and a good segue. I think the, um, in addition to making an impact related to housing and homelessness, I think um, to the point of value-based payment arrangements, this really speaks to the power of a partnership um, and really leveraging subject matter expertise and resources um, for the good of really making impact related to social determinants of health. So I'll just walk through um, our framework for the program. Um, Kathleen will speak in a little while to the specific criteria we decided on when we referred people for the program. Um, but essentially Temple sent to us what Patrick explained in terms of data and people who were um, high utilizers of the emergency department. Um, we took a look at that information and developed some criteria as a model to follow to refer people to the program. Keystone First and Health Partners Plans uh, contracted, as Kathleen mentioned, with uh, Resources for Human Development. And we contract with them for uh, three full-time uh, people who are, and the staff positions are varied in terms of their expertise. Uh, the team includes a peer support specialist, um, and this person largely um, serves people related to behavioral health and or substance use disorder. Care coordinator, a care coordinator serves as a general care coordination uh, resource for the person. And then a tenant services coordinator largely handles issues specific to housing, things like leases, um, utilities, furniture, that type of thing. So it was a very sort of holistic team that we contracted for um, to serve this population. Um, and the idea was really to get people, to connect with people and really engage with them. So RHD, Resources for Human Development, employs the staff and they used alerts in Temple's electronic health record. Um, and they also had access to a homeless management information system, which we lovingly refer to as HMIS. Neither Keystone nor HPP had as much access to the system as Resources for Human Development did, does. Um, and so we thought that that was a great benefit in terms of really trying to locate people. Um, the nature of an MCO, we do a lot of field-based work and I think this is really um, changed in the last few years. We're doing much more work that's community focused. Um, Kathleen mentioned community health workers and positions like that, but increasingly we're realizing that we cannot locate people, hard to reach people by simply calling them. Um, you know, we really have to meet them where they are in their communities, um, you know, where they're interacting on a day-to-day -day basis um, with trusted resources for this group. Um, and so we really have to broaden our outreach efforts. We also used um, the healthcare exchange, um, which notifies us when someone is in the emergency department or when they're in inpatient admission, when they're inpatient admission. 
Um, and then we really looked at um, as a team, we look at, I should say, as a team, anywhere we can locate members. We work, the MCOs have care coordination meetings, which we'll be talking about in a little while, where a lot of information is shared just to try to um, piece together services and resources for the people who were served in this pilot. And why did we do this? Um, you know, we wanted to move the needle in terms of utilization. We wanted to guide people more to primary care and day-to-day -day resources that they need, um, as opposed to having people repeatedly use the ER um, and, you know, sort of suffer readmissions and inpatient admissions that were um, unnecessary. Uh, we wanted to engage people in, um, in behavioral health services and or substance use treatment, if that's what was needed. And then we really wanted to want to look um, at whether or not providing housing um, and wraparound sort of support services to vulnerable people um, really improves their health outcomes and quality of life. Next slide. Sure, so I'm gonna dive in a little bit to the target population. Um, with Temple being the lead on this project, they really did provide us the initial data set to identify who on our plan um, had an inpatient stay or an emergency department visit at Temple in the last year. So we're losing at 2019 data. Um, so for Keystone and Health Partners together, that initially was a list of about 400 people. Um, so we did have to scrub that list and we've uh, I added some other considerations too. So. Um, so one list went to Keystone first, one list went to Health Partners, uh, and then the, the list itself was derived from the fact that a member um, had identified themselves as homeless. So either they had assigned an address of uh, the Temple University's main hospital, um, or they had an address of the Philadelphia Emergency Shelter at check-in, or utilized um, Broad Street Ministry, which is a large mail service um, for homeless and housing and stable people um, in the city. Um, so that was that first kind of tier. Um, we then kind of did some additional scrubbing to really focus on the folks with complex conditions, um, really see how we can address kind of their healthcare needs. Um, so we then uh, looked at folks with chronic medical conditions out of that list and folks that had a presence of serious and persistent mental illness and or a substance use disorder. Um, as referenced yesterday, um, in, in Pennsylvania, behavioral health is carved out. Um, so CBH or Community Behavioral Health, the Behavioral Health MCO was a key partner in helping us um, kind of look at this project holistically. And they were part of a lot of our care management teams and the early um, kind of meetings for this project. Um, so then Health Partners and Keystone also developed uh, another kind of consideration um, to kind of uh, whittle that list down even further. Um, and so we developed a common approach, which was that three out of the five members referred would have opioid use disorder. Um, that meant there would be members that were referred would have a minimum of $10,000 in total health care costs um, or claims for the year 2019. And that they had a minimum of seven months of consistent member eligibility in the health plan. One of the things that was great about collaborating with health partners on this be is because a lot of times um, members do go back and forth between plans. So we were looking for consistent member eligibility, but if we had a member who participated in the program that might have switched their plan to health partners, we could kind of keep them within the program. So that was, that was important. Um, just to give you a sense of when we talk about um, patients with multi-visit multi, multi -visit patients, or um, you might have here as frequent flyers or high healthcare utilizers. Uh, one of the sample members that we referred from Keystone side um, was an individual who had um, 15 emergency department visits and four hospitalizations in one year, had over $100,000 in healthcare claims costs, had diabetes, persistent mental illness, and opioid use disorder. We had done multiple attempts by our outreach team to reach out to this member, but we didn't have success. Um, and when um, RHD reached out to this member, and we'll get into a little bit more, it was the midst of COVID, um, we did identify this member and she was living on the streets um, and she is currently housed. And we'll kind of talk through a little bit of um, some of those next steps, but just to give you a sample of how we're trying to meet kind of the, the highest need members as part of this target population as well. So um, we started the program in April. Uh, we signed the contracts in, in March, started in April. And, and of the 57 referrals, we asked each MCO to send us five names each. And we would do outreach to those 10 people 
hopes to consent and engage five of them and then house those five people the following month. Well, as we all remember, um, COVID started in April and everything got shut down. So that kind of threw a lot of our plans out, out the window. We had a great plan to have a, a staff person stationed at the, at the emergency department at Temple on Thursday afternoons and evenings, Friday afternoons and evenings and Saturday mornings, which is what research tells us when people experiencing homelessness most frequent the, the emergency room. Um, so again, COVID threw all those things out the window. As a result, we only consented one person in April, which oddly enough became the last person we housed because they went back and forth from accepting our services to not accepting our services. However, the team did do the old fashioned detective work and outreach on the street um, and had, a lot of had to have a lot of collateral contacts to find uh, these individuals. We had contacts with family members, we had contacts with other outreach teams, with shelter staff, um, with the Homeless Management Information System, HMIS. Um, it's important to note that just over half of the individuals that we received had any history in the HMIS system, which to us tells us that some of these homeless individuals were not homeless in the traditional ways, or were not homeless in the places on the street where Tr traditional outreach uh, workers would find them. They were homeless in North Philadelphia many times and not in Center City where most of a lot of the outreach happens. So um, as a result, we believe that about nine of these individuals would have had a tough time fitting the federal definition of homelessness because it, because it would have been a challenge to verify their homelessness because they were couch surfing, because they were squatting, because they were uh, in a rooming house or in an abandoned house. Um, it's also important to, to note that when we reached out to these individuals, about five to six of these individuals were already being housed by other programs in the city, which also tells us that, that the system was working. Um, it just wasn't working fast enough um, for the individuals who are on the street. Um, it's also important to note that there, we see there's, there's been about three different groups, uh, folks with persistent mental health uh, challenges, folks with opioid use disorder, and a few individuals with, with alcohol dis, uh, disorder, uh, use disorder, as they're made, and every single one of these individuals have major medical issues that were not being addressed. Um, it's also important to note that 11 of the 25 individuals have SSI. Uh, one person is currently employed, and we are in the process of, of working towards uh, the next steps in, in applying for SSI and employment. So you can go to the next slide, Kristen. Thanks, Bill. So again, we wanted to sort of give you a sense of exactly what needed to happen and some of the operational details um, and how different, uh, different parts of the team worked. So initially the goal was to find people. We had to do work with um, Resources for Human Development to do um, to use as much information as possible to try to find those people who we wanted to offer housing. So we use the RHD field-based care teams. Um, and it's worth mentioning, um, Bill alluded to this, that COVID did really throw a wrench in things. Um, specific to Philadelphia, there were a number of restrictions around field-based, face-to-face community work. Um, but nevertheless, resources for human development use their care team. We did use the HMIS system, as I mentioned, and then as much as possible, we used other indicators um, like from the Temple ED and that type of thing. The goal originally in the first 30 days was to obtain consent for the program. And then um, the MCOs sort of consistently were um, engaged with the RHD team, offering any type of contact information, um, family contacts, uh, last known shelter contact, anything that um, we could use to provide, um, you know, greater likelihood that RHD would be able to connect with people. Um, we looked at uh, recent emergency department and hospital visits. And in fact, we're going to talk through some case studies. Um, and this is actually how we located someone who we ultimately housed. Um, we can, had to continue to monitor uh, eligibility status 
Um, and then anything that had been done previously to engage with a member, um, you know, we wanted to try to use that as a resource as well. So seek and find sort of came first. Once a member was located um, and connected with uh, RHD staff, um, enrolled uh, these patients into Housing Smart and had consent signed. Um, and then the goal was to really house them within 45 days. The, the one nuance here that we, you know, in terms of lessons learned was that the eviction moratorium did impact the availability of housing for people um, in Philadelphia. So, um, you know, uh, what is that two sides of the same coin or, you know, there's, I'm not sure what that saying is, but sort of good and bad there, um, very justified eviction moratorium, but it did limit the available housing. And that was a consideration um, as we tried to get people housed. So in terms of stabilization, um, we the teams meet every two weeks, their care coordination meetings every two weeks. I should mention too that we have leadership calls. We were having them every two weeks. We recently transitioned to every month so that at a leadership level, we could um, sort of look at progress, discuss activity, um, anything that was happening within the team specific to um, Temple and the ED or specific to the field-based care management team or field-based team with resources for human development, any new information from the respective MCOs, we sort of talked through it and course corrected where needed. So as people are housed in the stabilization phase, um, resources for human development staff are engaged with these people. They're working very hard to stay connected with them. Um, Kathleen will talk in a little while about sort of as we get into year two, some of the, um, the our efforts and, and interest in sort of sustainability, looking at things like employment, um, talking through things like closing care gaps. Um, those, those, that um, sort of verbiage is very familiar to the Temple team and the MCO team, but um, one of, in a care coordination call early on, one of the RHD team said, what is a care gap? <laughs> and so there was, there's a lot of cross training, cross education that's happening as we're continuing to meet. Um, and we talked a little bit about the goal of not just redu reducing utilization, but increasing connection to primary care, helping people to manage their medications, close care gaps, um, and then really referring to not only treatment uh, resources, but community supports. Um, you know, what does a person need to sort of be um, healthy and, you know, feeling good about where they are uh, with their housing and their life? Um, so next slide, please. So we thought we'd just highlight and just kind of personalize some of the stories of the members that we have worked with and most likely RHD. And really the, the story that I'm going to share from Keystone First really does focus on the cross-sector collaboration that has been so important in engaging um, this high-risk member into the program. Um, I'm going to be changing um, the person's name for the sake of identity sake, but um, so James was referred to Housing Smart um, by Keystone in April. Uh, and according to CBH, who is um, Community Behavioral Health, one of the key partners um, too on this project, uh, he had been homeless for seven years and had a history of persistent mental illness and substance abuse, which correlated in a high number of emergency department visits. Uh, when the member was found by the Art Housing Smart team um, using uh, collateral contacts, um, because the member had no working phone um, at a drop-in center. Um, they used collateral contacts um, at a drop-in center, HMIS, and a friend of the member. The Housing Smart team um, really had a tough time engaging with him. It took several months. Um, he, when he was um, engaged and was identified, um, he was actively using alcohol and was never coherent enough to understand or consent to the program. Um, in the less than five weeks from the point that RHD met uh, James, um, he, James visited the city's emergency departments over eight times, uh, and it was a notification that we received on a daily um, uh, healthcare exchange notification that the team, once they received that notice that James was in the emergency department, they would reach out to the emergency department. By, by that time, he often would leave. Um, and he was visiting the ED for alcohol abuse and suicidal ideations. 
Uh, and working with the team's peer specialist, um, which was important because uh, the peer specialist really does have lived experience. And after his last ED visit to Einstein, um, the member did consent to and entered a treatment facility for substance use disorder in early September, 2020. Um, in late September, our Keystone First ACT nurse, who typically reaches out to members who have visits at the emergency department at Einstein, did receive a call from James um, from the treatment facility. Uh, she had been in contact with him after his most recent visit, and she had also been encouraging him to engage with the supportive services being offered by Housing Smart. On the call, James expressed his excitement in moving into an apartment. Um, with Housing Smart once he discharged from the program. Um, and it was about a month later on October 31st, 2020, that James moved into his uh, new apartment. We recognize that this is not the just the first stop for James. Um, and, um, and so the team really has been working with him um, hand in hand um, about his sobriety because he often only has about five days of sobriety before he does um, use alcohol again. Um, and that does correlate again into his visits to the emergency department. So. Housing, um, receiving keys to your apartment isn't just is the first step, but really, as, as Krista mentioned earlier, we're really focusing on stabilization. Um, but we recognize that if James is not able to stay sober, um, we're not going to be able to address his behavioral health and medical needs. Um, so that's going to be a key focus um, for his journey moving forward. Kristen? Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so uh, I will also change names. Um, the person that um, we, one of the people that we housed on the HPP side is a 52 year old woman with a past history of trauma, significant trauma, substance use disorder, um, and high utilization in, both in inpatient and in the emergency department. Um, in six months preceding the program, she had been to the ED 55 times. When she became um, eligible for Housing Smart, um, we had a similar situation to the Keystone First member. Um, often she would get to the ED and the, the notification would go to Resources for Human Development to try to meet her at the emergency department, but she would leave frequently we were actually able to connect with her during an inpatient stay, um, which is where she agreed to participate in the program. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this person is, and, and this gets a little bit to the cross education, um, is that she is housed, she has maintained her, um, her apartment, but for a long time upon being housed, she would sleep in the chair. Um, she suffered with a lot of guilt and shame about past activities while using abusing substances um, and just didn't feel like she deserved having a roof over her head. Um, so she's the team is really working with her and encouraging her to sort of sleep in her bed um, and to let her know that you know she she really is very worthy of this. Um, the other thing that is interesting about this person is that her relationships have, have improved. Prior to being housed, she was um, couch surfing, as Bill uh, mentioned earlier. She was staying with family members for extended periods of time, which sort of wore her relationships down. Um, people were sort of hesitant to be connected with her um, for that reason. And once she became housed, um, she had her own roof over her head. Her relationships really have improved. Um, she's much more connected with people. And that type of you know, interconnectedness, I think, really encourages long-term stabilization. Next slide. Bill? Yep. Um, I see some questions coming in about the finances. So uh, we, we were ready for that. So here's the here are the uh, example of the cost of the programs. As you and the in the pie shot pie chart that you see right there on the right side, you'll see that the MCOs, the managed care entities, are paying for the services. Uh, and on the left side is the housing, the housing budget. Uh, the housing is being paid for by Temple. You, Temple is putting $100,000 of their, their own money into the, the, uh, the pot for housing. The Home for Good Foundation, which is a program of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh uh, that works with the continuum of cares across the, the state to uh, provide funding for housing initiatives. And then uh, Temple uh, 
worked with the state to get what is called PACMAC fund funding for uh, the remaining uh, vouchers. So we have money from the state through Temple um, uh, for people with opioid use disorder. That money has to be used for folks with opioid use disorder. Um, and as you can see from at the bottom right hand uh, corner is that the cost of the program for the subsidy for the year uh, the, the general cost is about $15,000. And then for the team itself, which is paid for from the MCOs again, is about $12,000 per person. So as a total cost per person per year is $27,000. Now RHD runs shelters in Philadelphia that costs um, and, and in, and in uh, uh, Montgomery County that cost anywhere from 95 to $105 a day. Um, so you can see that this is actually cheaper than uh, shelters where, because in the shelters, you have to have 24 hour staff, you have to have security, you have to feed people three, three meals a day. Um, uh, and compare this, many of these individuals have criminal justice histories. It costs about $119 a day for someone to spend a day in the Philadelphia jail system. And we believe this um, program uh, is very cost effective, um, saving multiple systems lots of money through this intervention. The homeless services system, outreach, uh, police interacting with uh, home, homeless individuals on the street, the jail system, the hospital system, and the managed care entities. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, just to answer some of those questions, um, we have enough money in, in housing subsidies uh, to pay for each individual to be housed for two years at this point. We're trying to track down more money so we can house more people and potentially for longer. It's also important to note that the, um, the people who are in this program are not seen as permanently housed by the city of Philadelphia. So they still are eligible to get permanent housing vouchers from the city of Philadelphia that we, we will be working on over the next uh, year and a half. Um, so here's some just general dem demographics and some po some things to point out is 80% of the participants are African American. This is reflective of, of what you will see on the streets of Philadelphia. Um, also, it's important to note that two individuals do identify as transgender. And um, it's important to note that this, this population is traditionally uh, uh, has a hard time going into the shelter system in Philadelphia um, and being served by that system. So um, it, it's important to note that 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 they uh, accepted services in this program where they traditionally has not accepted uh, other services in the system. Um, it's also important to note that over at 60% of our participants are um, baby boomers. They're over 50 over 50 years old, and um, and it's important to note that the other two, uh, what would you you would call Gen X, Generation X or the baby boomers, babies, gener generation Y are about 20% each of the, of the population. You can go to the next slide. Sure, so uh, kind of in reference to some of the questions with the next steps and the lessons learned for Housing Smart, um, this started off as a pilot project. So we're just in year one um, where we're housing 25 people. For year two, we expect that we won't be able to house any additional slots. Um, as, as Bill mentioned, we're, we're kind of kind of uh, constrained with our housing dollars, but we do have budgeted in the fact that we may have some folks who just maybe um, drop out or are no longer with the program. And so we've budgeted it about um, some additional referrals if that happens. Um, but really one of the things we're working on now that um, everyone is housed is to look at the team training and education. Um, I think what was important to note, Dr. Jacobs mentioned yesterday on the call, is that if you're partnering with an MCO, they're just not a funder. They are really a partner. Um, and so uh, both Kristen, Patrick, and I are very involved in terms of looking at how this pilot project is working, what are some needs um, for the team. And, and so we're focusing in on kind of that medical case management component of how we can equip the RHD team with resources that we know on our side, what kinds of medications that the member may be receiving? What, what do they do? Are they picking them up? Um, what are care gaps? How can we help close them? Um, so Temple um, is stepping up in early 2021 to provide um, a training that we had intended to do as part of kind of that on-site work, um, but had to kind of change that direction with COVID. Um, so the community health worker program is going to be providing some trainings on just kind of as community health workers, when we look at medical case management, how we can get people connected to the right kind of care. And as Krista mentioned earlier, we do have members who've been traumatized by the healthcare system, who have had negative experiences. How can we 
assist them? How can we accompany them to appointments? It's really, that's gonna be a really key driver for this program to be successful is to making sure that people feel that they can get reconnected to care again. Um, and you're seeing that writ large too with the COVID-19 vaccine, how communities are just been disenfranchised with healthcare, um, are, not just, are not very trustful of the vaccine. And, and that's certainly a, a, what we're experiencing here with this particular project. Um, one thing that we're doing now as, as part of our care management meetings too, is as we look at members, um, is focusing in on their employment and benefit supports, um, how they can get connected to additional income, how we can uh, prepare them for jobs, um, and looking at the ability of that member to pay for housing on their own. Um, so that is gonna be able for us to be able to sustain this program is that members continue to contribute um, to the costs of housing, but given the real vulnerability of members prior to housing, it's really getting them stabilized, getting them connected to the right supports. Um, and that's really what we focus in on year two of, of Housing Smart. Um, Kristen? Thanks, Kathleen. Um, and the other thing I would add to that is really broadening their opportunities. Um, historically, uh, this group of people has not had many opportunities, but really broadening their scope of opportunity, um, you know, to make choice, um, to be empowered with um, expertise and resources that will really benefit them um, and sort of keep the uh, positive trajectory sort of going. Um, so in terms of lessons learned, as you might imagine, there were many. Um, the collateral contacts are, con for those who don't know, are contacts with not specifically uh, a patient or a member, um, but with everyone around them. And it's outreach and connecting with anyone who may have seen them last or um, may know a family member and a way to get in touch with them. And I think those kinds of contacts, and I would say problem solving, um, were really critical links in making connections. Um, this group of people is typically not a group of people that you will get on the phone with the most recent number you have. Um, you have to sort of do a lot of outreach. And I think we really used um, all of the partners in the program to try to, you know, find connections and, and find contact information. And this was really critical um, during COVID-19 as well, where it was a little harder to connect. Um, I think the cross-sector tools have really, um, they really give a, a complete picture of um, who these members are, what their goals are, what their histories are. Um, and I think, you know, the MCOs, when we do our care co coordination calls, are not able to talk about each other's members. Those meetings are respective um, in terms of uh, member privacy. Um, and but nevertheless, we had CBH at the table. We have them with us regularly, um, you know, and they, as well as RHD staff, um, and we just you know problem solve together um, and really look at um, each other's expertise and and way of serving um, members sort of holistically. Um, Kathleen, I think alluded to this, um, just really making sure that we're looking at member needs, um, phys both physical and behavioral health. Um, we, we absolutely you know, want to drive down utilization, but we really want to support members around their own goals um, and interests. Um, but so to do that, you know, I think it will be very important to sort of stay in touch with them as much as possible and encourage those relationships. Um, and then I think, you know, I can't say enough to the potential for these kinds of collaborative efforts in the future. I mean, I think um, Kathleen mentioned that it's been a wonderful collaboration, and those are exactly the words that I would use. Um, you know, Temple used all of its resources and resources for human development is using their resources. Um, Keystone First and HPP are, are absolutely using their resources and we're problem solving together. We're collaborating. We talk. Um, you don't, there are some programs where MCOs, um, you know, competitors work together, but this is really one that's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience. There's just so much communication Sometimes we may not always agree on every little thing, but we always find a solution. Um, and I think we really keep 
those people that we've tried to house and that we're continuing um, to try to house forefront. Um, everyone is very aligned on the long-term goals for this program. And I think I can't say enough for, you know, working through things, problem solving um, to, to get to that final goal. Thanks, Kristen. Um, Patrick, I just want to see if there's anything you'd like to add in terms of lessons learned from a health major health system perspective. From a health system standpoint, yeah. I mean, in the beginning, introducing this to all the various care management teams across all the various care settings that this health system is comprised of, uh, they, they were on board at first glance, but um, are 100% on board now uh, in our our cheerleaders of the program because they saw the direct effect of, oh, this person that I used to see every every week, uh, or in some cases on a every other day basis, got linked to the appropriate level of care and, and are doing really good. I'll, I will give them updates from our care management meetings uh, that that are positive on, you know, this person got a job, this person um, is doing really good. Um, and, and also, with health systems uh, across the city of Philadelphia, um, we were able to communicate what we were attempting to accomplish um, with, with this finite target list of patients. And from, uh, we, I don't ever think of other health systems as competitors in the city of Philadelphia because we have a very large population, um, but they were also serving as partners to help however they could, uh, whenever they could. So that was also a really positive takeaway that uh, if you do put together a program like this, don't hesitate to reach out and ask a question of somebody who you may or may not view of as a teammate. Because uh, again, I think to Kristen's point, Everybody understands the value of this and uh, it's not easy. So uh, get, get the help where and when you can. Um, that, that would be all I had to add. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I think there are a few questions that are coming through, but just in summary, I, I think we just really wanted to demonstrate for this group um, that housing and health can come together. Um, and it really with the, uh, the right opportunity and the right provider and, and RHD to really did a uh, kind of years long kind of um, elevator pitch about this initiative to us at Keystone, uh, to Temple and to health partners. And um, I really think the, the right ingredients were in place for us to develop this. Uh, and, and so we're really excited just to see what the Patrick, um, the results that he, he's shared, which is a 76% reduction in emergency department utilization from the point of being from pre and post housing. And really in the next few months, um, we really hope to see that, that those um, trends continue and that we get better connections to primary care in the future. So um, thanks for everyone's participation. And just to kind of go to some of the questions, um, and um, team members feel free to jump in. But the first one being, were there any HIPAA barriers before care management teams could commence? Um, I can start that one. So um, just uh, to uh, remind uh, the group that we, um, Keystone, as well as health partners had separate uh, contract agreements with resources for human development. And as part of that, there typically was like a business use or data use agreement um, involved that would protect our members' confidentiality. Um, that we talked about a consent. And so when we referred a member over to RHD, we typically provided a name, uh, a date of birth, uh, a member ID number, which really wouldn't mean much to the team. Uh, we would provide an address of what we have on file. Um, and that on file address is typically the address that someone establishes member eligibility with the county assistance office um, and a phone number. Um, and then also maybe uh, the provider that they may be associated with. That was the extent of what we provided initially. Um, and then RHD would run their traps um, utilizing HMIS um, outreach contacts. Um, and then once that met, if they were able to make connections um, at the point of engagement and the member signed consent, based on the scope of that consent, we could provide additional information based on uh, medical history. So that's kind of the, the different stages of what we could provide based on uh, the level of consent that was provided by the member 
um, and then also based on um, kind of the engagement um, uh, when we uh, through that data use agreement that we had with RHD. Anything else to add, team? Is anything? Just that it was distinct, so that we I didn't see anything related to I've never seen anything related to Keystone first. Um, nor has Keystone First ever seen anything from HPP. So all of that information was in place and it remains entirely distinct. Any other questions at all from the panel? Do we? I I can see the chat, Kathleen. Can you see the? Did we answer all the questions in the chat? Yeah. If you see one that I do not see, why don't you go ahead and read it? Sure, sure. So, um, Kate put a question in around the program term. Um, so, Bill mentioned that we started in. Uh, so, both, let me mention that both Keystone First and HPP um, used community based care management funds for this. Um, and that is a calendar year term, although there is allowability for carrying over funds for a, a finite time into the next year. Um, so largely we go year by year. Um, and while we uh, didn't start right in January, we started officially, I think we, I think our contracts were signed in March. Um, Correct. That, Kathleen, or, yes. yeah. So our contracts were started in March. Um, we started effectively in April. We'll carry through for a year beyond that. And then um, we had the program renewed um, for another year um, into 2021. I hope that answers. Anything people would add there? No, I think you covered it. Um, okay. So um, I hope everyone learned something today about this initiative. Um, we're excited to maybe potentially come back next year um, and share some more um, results of how things are going. Um, but again, this is, uh, you know, we've been tweaking things along the way, um, a lot of communication amongst these partners, and it's really been a really great experience. Uh, and um, so uh, we did post our project contact list, and I know this um, will be shared amongst the group. So if there's any additional questions, feel free to reach out. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thanks. Thank you.